for now. Um, concurrent hybrid, that's the first one on the list. And that is on campus and remote students attend class synchronously. Instruction and class interactions are live streamed to allow two-way interaction. Asynchronous hybrid on-campus instruction is recorded and made available for remote students to access asynchronously at another time. No live streaming. Sequential hybrid on-campus and remote students meet in separate consec consecutive sessions where instruction is repeated. Multi-section hybrid online and on-campus instruction work occur in separate sections, potentially taught by different instructors. Two sections being taught by different instructors. And number five, alternating hybrid, all students are required to attend some on-campus instruction, but attend in smaller groups to comply with health guidelines. When not on campus, students engage in learning activities online. So those are the, those are the five that I, I guess Saborna is gonna be talking about those today. So what, what I'd like to hear is, is uh, who's in the room, what experience have you had with these different modalities? And um, maybe if you've, if you've used one or which one you think might be best that you're most interested in learning about today. So you can do so by unmuting or typing in the chat. Hi, um, I'm not an instructor myself. I work in educational technology, but I, um, I'm interested in hearing more about concurrent hybrid and strategies for ensuring students in both uh, modalities are um, included in classwork because I find that tends to be a real um, stumbling block for that modality. Okay, students in both, so, so you're looking for tips on how students uh, in both modes can be included. Exactly, exactly. Okay, we'll share that with Suborna. Anybody else? Um, alternating hybrid so far, Wilma. Uh, but interested in the alternatives. Um, if you don't mind sharing, Wilma, we'd love to hear more about alternating hybrid and your experience with that. Alternating simply being in-person, alternating uh, weeks or alternating every two weeks with fully online, but synchronous online with the same group of students for all of it, which has been interesting, but I'm curious about some of the, a lot of the alternatives. Thanks for this. Yeah, me too. Some of these, um, yes, the, I'm, I'm, I can imagine all of them, but I'm really looking forward to hearing about her experience and, and your experiences as well. So Saborna, just can I share with you that, um, that there is a one participant who's particularly interested in concurrent hybrid strategies for including all students, you know, in the two modes, how, how you've done that. So so I'll just share that with you and then um, we'll, we'll let you just start your presentation. Um, so I'm Shubana Ahmed. So today uh, I'm going to talk about my experience about hybrid modality. So um, I am an assistant professor of teaching in the forest resources management department in the faculty of forestry at UBC. So today I'm joining from um, UBC Point Grey campus, which sits on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of Musqueam uh, First Nation. So I'm joining from home and I stay at UBC, so that's why. Um, and then um, I will try to demonstrate how course models that I had pre-pandemic was structured and then how I actually converted them. So how I can make the environment adequate for the learner so that it can be more collaborative and engaging for them. So in real time, how teaching team, that means myself and TAs, how they can actually present and then be supportive on campus and animal students. So I'll go through all of them so that you can also reflect on those. So I'll also try to see uh, whether you can try to select what might be the best for your course, which modality, because as Ainsley um, described five of them. So you can try to find out which one you want to do, because we do not want to do double the work. We have to do, and then our tiers need to do the same amount of time they have to spend so that we don't go over the board. We have to be um, more efficient and how we can adjust the modules to add up the modality. So few ways you can do that, but then again, I will show you from where I started for this modality. And then there were some challenges because um, 
I offered it from last summer and then term one, term two, so three times I offered it. And then over the time, I actually got better. I tried to overcome challenges. And then now I feel much better. And then I feel like all my courses, I will be teaching five courses uh, from this fall. And then um, I prefer to do hybrid. So my also my um, dean office, our department head and everyone actually supportive of doing this approach. Let's let's go into the detail. So the course I am actually applying, right, applied in three times is the computer application in forestry. So I was preparing students so, so that it, they should be proficient in high level computing and analyzing variety of forestry related data set. So it's more kind of quantitative analysis using the forestry data set. So over there we have four modules, but I divided them into six uh, learning modules. So we have document processing, data handling, and then data visualizing and managing and analyzing the geo data sets. So over, over, the, over the term, they actually start really, really slow. And then try to I try to see where they sit at the beginning. And then I try to modify a little bit, not much, and then try to see where I can take them. So every time I try to um, see at the beginning, I send some surveys, I try to see what the levels are because cohort to cohort, it varies. So they actually, tr I try to make them more efficient in document processing using powerful tools in Microsoft Word, also in uh, Microsoft Excel so that they can actually write documentation, larger documentation or create reports for their um, co-op programs or maybe for their high level courses. And then they also try to learn how they can handle and summarize data set in using Microsoft Excel. Also, after they feel comfortable analyzing the data set, then I take them to programming and then they actually handle the data set and analyze the data set using programming tools like R um, and R we use R Markdown. It is a statistical package we use and they saw that they actually um, do some basic calculation, then the high quality of graphs they can create, high quality of summarization they can prepare, and then they work on managing and analyzing geo database because in forestry we use a many times we use spatial data, so they actually try to work on some projects how they can organize them. So that's four of them, but then I get divided them into six modules. That's the question because Ainsley already mentioned that some of you were interested, and then Ainsley already describe five modules to you. And then what do you think the best approach or type of mod hybrid modality you can implement in your course? Maybe think about it so that we can, we know which one might be the better um, approach for you because we cannot apply all of them. We have to select one, or maybe we can select two, and then we can apply wherever we have suitable uh, area that we can have hybrid modality. Since you are joining this session, I guess most of you are planning to do hybrid or some kind of hybrid because I do not think we have to apply hybrid in every segment. And then I will show you in which area I applied and then where I'm going from there. So let's see. I saw um, that there were some chats. And then uh, Sarah, you say that uh, you are mostly interested about concurrent hybrid modality. That's great. This is actually what I applied in my course. That's the first step I took. So alternative hybrid modality, Wilma, you said um, interested in alternative. Yes, alternative could be an option for you. Um, so alternative hybrid, the students will be adding um, because this modality is mainly for um, let's say you have a small class and also there is a um, restriction. If there is any restriction uh, in how many students can join in a class, then you can think of applying that. That should be fine. But then again, you have to think about alternative hybrid Then you have to give students requirements when they can join in person, when they can join online, because they cannot always join uh, in person or they cannot always join on, online. So that means it, it's a little bit more work. That's what I found. But then again, if it works for your course, and then maybe you can try in one segment and then see how it goes and how students feel. Anyone else? Have you think about any of the hybrid modality? Let me show you which one we are talking about. The concurrent approach, asynchronous, sequential, or maybe multi-section and alternative. 
Another thing you need to think about, as I said at the beginning, that um, you have to think about your, you only have certain amount of TA hours. That means teaching assistants cannot go over the board. And then also you, you cannot do double the work. So some of them, I feel like it's more of kind of, let's say, sequential hybrid. In sequential hybrid, the students are joining actually separately. So that means um, you have to repeat them. And if you repeat them, that means it's double the work. So that's something you need to uh, aware about because maybe your different department head gave you a um, few courses and then whether you can do double the work in one course. Anyhow, so that's what you can think about. That's where I actually started. And then you can take a look at this QR code. So in C Center for Teaching and Learning at UBC. So I, I found this paper really, really helpful for me when I was choosing uh, one of the approach. That's the first step I took. Okay, so next we will be talking about, um, since we, we already talked about this one, which hybrid model might be the best for you, then you can take a look at that paper and then you, you think about where you want to apply them. So as I mentioned, I applied the concurrent hybrid modality because I found that in that modality, our TAs and then myself as an instructor, I can synchronously um, actually apply this modality. So we also have some asynchronous um, materials. I will show you how I structured. But then again, students, whenever they are at the synchronous session, then it's not double the work for me. Also, students are who are joining in person, who are joining online, they're getting the same kinds of help. That means oh, I'm not even providing them like other modality. I'm not providing them um, the, the video of the recorded session in synchronous session. That means students can ask me question anytime whenever they're in the session. Also, they can ask TAs uh, the same question. So that, that way they feel more comfortable also, they, we have some option. I'll show you the, they can communicate with each other uh, in the group activities. Because in, if you, we are providing the recording to online students, then there is no way that students can actually communicate with each other. Okay, so let's show you um, the adaptation strategies that I took so that I can actually, um, more, not modifying, but adjusting my learning modules. Since I have six of them, so I structured them in a similar fashion. So those are really, really highly structured and easy to follow. Why is that? Because in our courses, whenever we teach in person or online, then we have the specific materials and students come in, they follow our instruction. But whenever I have hybrid modality, I'm helping both groups at the same time, then maybe connection, I could lose the connection or anyone could lose the connection, or maybe some there could be some communication gap. If you have the structured module, if students are, students can follow your module really in, in an easier step, they know, yes, this is what we will be doing today. This is what we planned. And then this is what are the materials we have. This is how the steps will go. Then that's easier for a hybrid class. So that means if there is any gap in communication, still they can proceed with the learning module or they can do the group activities or they can solve the problems. So I will show you how I was communicating with students so that no one is getting lost or no, no one is confused in the course. So the assessment criteria I have are quiz, discussion questions, where they have the option to do group activities, and then assignment, they're again solving the assignments during the lab time um, in a um, group, and then presentation peer review, they are actually choosing some topic based on what they learned, and then they have, they have to provide each other some uh, reviews. We have two exam, midterm, and final exam. So you can see that I'm showing you one of the module where students were preparing the graphical presentation, and then we have asynchronous learning part. Then in the discussion time, we have fifth classroom approach. And then uh, we also have the hybrid modality only in the lab activity part. This is the most important part for this course where I applied 
corn current hybrid modality so that I can support in a synchronous session both groups. So that's what I started. But then again, from this fall, since I am pretty comfortable with hybrid modality, so that's why I thought I will apply in all sessions, in the uh, lecture time, in the discussion time, all time I will use hybrid modality. Now I have the learning design. So it, I would like to go over a little bit detail about the learning design. But if you have any question, you can write down on the chat box or you can raise your hand. I can, I can always stop and then provide you more detail. So this is how I structured the learning design. So you can see that I provided them what are the lesson objectives and then what they should be doing in that lesson. So they have to go through each part. So you can see if they go to part one, I provided them some lesson objective again for that part and then lecture videos, and then all the associated uh, files that I produce in the video what I showed, I provided them so that, that they can easily follow. After, after watching the video and working with these files, they have to complete the quiz. This quiz is really, really simple, but that will actually help themselves, um, efficient themselves. So they, they know, yes, what they learn, they can actually apply them, but they can take the quiz um, one more time. So they have that option. So on these um, part one to part four, I structured them in a similar fashion. So we, they have the learning modules. They have the self-efficacy from these uh, quizzes. That part they really like because they can directly see that uh, what they learn, whether they can apply. And then we have the tryout themselves because I provided them lots of example because we don't have specific textbook that they can follow because you know in computation world every every day or maybe every month um, everything is changing so I always have to keep them updated so that's why I provided them worked out examples in that example I gave them questions and solution I asked them not to look at the solution first do the do the um problems themselves first and then look at the solution. So we have the discussion session. So before coming to the discussion session, students have to complete previous components and all quizzes so that they can bring in their question and then learning activities involve solving their questions and then in a smaller group. So they have to, because I used to send them to random groups so that they get to know each other so because you know whenever we are in online world we have last two years what happened so students do not know each other so that's something kind of breaking the ice because students were feeling students were feeling not uh, comfortable at first joining the random group but then again after two three weeks they found that yes this is helpful because they get to know more people so they bring in and then they solve problem together and then they actually introduce, then I introduce them the next learning module in that time whenever they're done with the discussion. Then during the lab activities where I apply the hybrid modality, so I demonstrate the lab activities and then solve the, how they can solve the problem in a, in a shared platform. So I'll show you how, in what, um, how I was doing that in a single platform. So this is the overall idea of learning materials, self-efficacy, and a work out example, everything, actually all the modules, the six modules I have that follow the same structure, exactly same structure. So students, if they work with me um, two weeks, they already get to know, yes, what to expect and how they can actually proceed with the course. Then the question is, how we can design our classroom? We, we already selected our hybrid modality that we want to use. Now we, we actually adjusted our learning modules. Now is the question is how we can design our classroom because I actually offered this course in three different classrooms because I uh, over the last one year, I offered it three times in hybrid modality. So in different, different classrooms, we have different kinds of devices available, how we can better use them. So I was definitely using a laptop and then, um, and then I bring in my microphone um, and then I was using the headphone. In some classroom, we have lapel mic. That is really, really helpful, but in some classroom, we didn't have. Then I have to use my own Bluetooth enabled headphone so that I can walk around in the class. And camera for live streaming, also recording the session so that students, if they miss anything, they can see it later time. 
and then where the intern is preferred. But in our, you know, one of our lab, undergraduate lab, we don't have the wired internet. So I have to use the Wi-Fi. There's no way. So how I planned is that I had four Gs in all terms. And then I, I was in person, I was online. So I was in the classroom. And then the, um, let me actually draw that might be helpful for you. So that's the same structure um, people followed um, in other courses. So I showed them how I structured that worked well. So they, they found it really, really helpful. So I actually went to the class and then I was sitting at the, in, the, in front of the class. And then in the overhead monitor, I showed them the, my, my screen where I have the room in a book. And I showed them who are joining online. Also students, if they prefer, because I saw that many students these days are bringing their laptop, they also use their, um, their Zooms. Those so they say that they hear better, they actually want to look at their laptop in their screen so that they can um, actually see better and then take notes. That was useful for them. And then um, I divided the TAs into two groups. So I had four TAs. So two TAs were helping in person. So they joined the class and then I set one of them in one side and another person in another side. And then I had two TAs who were at home or later sometime they were actually on campus. I gave them some office. They were joining. Um, from outside the class so that there is no noise for online students. That was really, really helpful. Otherwise, if TAs are joining from the class, then, then online students may hear a lot of noises. That was that was really helpful. So TAs were used to, and then I shuffle them. Sometimes I say that this week, these two TAs will be joining in person. Next week, they will go online so that there is a flexibility for students as well. Also, if they do not feel well at some point, they can join online if, if, they, if, they, if they feel like. And then that was helpful. Also, same thing for students. So I gave them opportunity to join online or join in person. So that's how it was structured. Then facilitation. So this is really, really, really helpful. I would recommend that. Um, so so I, I see there is a question. Let me go back to the previous slide. So the question is, um, how did you handle student questions from in-person if the student also did not have mics? Oh, in-person student? Yeah, so that's something I will actually show you since you asked. I can show you right now. Repeating question after they have been asked for the benefit of those watching on the stream. Yeah, so that's that's really good question. I know what you meant. So in person student, if the classroom is really big, so if they have their cell phone or if they have their, let's say, um, their laptop, most of, as I say, most of them were bringing their laptop. Then I told them since, you know, all of them have their cell phone with them, then let me show you. So I'm using the Teams page and then I gave access to all of them. So this, is, this is UBC's Teams and then all of them have access to Teams and I created Teams page and I said that this week what we will be doing. So what are our agendas? And then um, I divided them online and in person. So you can see that online students because we had two sessions um, on, on Wednesday and Friday, so because we have large class in, in term two. So I'm showing you from term two, and then students were actually writing them over here. And then I said, who will be helping them? Who will be answering to their question? We have to write down TA's name or instructor's name. And then we'll go in there and we help them. And then in person students, same thing. Some in person students were writing, I can't even see in here, because sometimes they delete them. And then they can also write down and then we can help them from there. We don't have to always go close to them and then help them because during the summer time that happened because we were not allowed to go close to them. Then we say that, how about you, you write down your question or maybe uh, if it is um, 10 feet uh, away on, I don't know how, how much it was the restriction. No, we did that. But anyhow, so many or many students were actually doing that. They were writing it on the Teams page so that online students can see it. And then I can see that, yes, students are getting help or not. Whenever they got help, then I can see that, yes, who helped them. And I said, I said done so that I know, yes, they got help. But anyhow, this is one way of doing that. 
Thanks for asking. And let's go to the next one. Okay. So facilitation, I would say, if it is possible at all for you, provide training session to TA before before, before you um, applied hybrid modality, maybe just one hour session with TAs so that you have hybrid modality say that, okay, can you join online or can you be in person? And then, then the other people can act as a student. And then we will see that how they were actually helping and then how, because we have to use teams and we have to provide them help so that in-person and online students together, they can actually get same kinds of help so that they are not feeling like they're left alone. So many times I also ask students uh, during the class time, how are you actually getting help? Uh, do you have any problem getting help since you join in different platform? Students were freely saying uh, what they were feeling. And then I was also collecting surveys for the research. Anyway, so providing training for using devices for TAs will be really, really helpful. And then um, also to students, I would say specify specifically what kind of modality, what is that? And then what should, would be the expectation in hybrid modality? So I many times I say that because I had COVID um, on the first week of January, and then I said, you know what, I will, I have COVID, but I can still help you. So I will be online, you can get help uh, from the class. So, and then same thing for them. So they can actually go online or in person. And I actually had a practice session with students so that they feel really, really comfortable working with me, working with TAs. So this, sometimes we had, I think late arrival happened in term one in the fall term. And then they had quarantine period so that we have to help them. And that was really helpful because they have the option to join online at any time point. Since students can any time point join online, join in person, then students felt really good because it's not always that they are not feeling well. In some point, let's say they only have one class, they don't want to come to the, um, to the campus if they live really far, or maybe um, they're not feeling well, or maybe they have an exam. Um, and then they want to join online. This is totally fine. Or if they feel like, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm able to come on campus because last two years, they're so used to joining online. So um, they sometimes feel like, no, no, I don't want to go uh, next week in the, in, in the camp on campus. But anyhow, that was really, really helpful for the students, but also for the TAs. So communication tools, I already showed you the Teams page. So, so the, for communication, uh, let me show you one more time. So for communication, since I use Teams page, Teams page is really, really used to create. And then I created lots of files for them. Let me show you. So I gave them access. So random people do not have access in there. Only TAs and students have access. So I created uh, for the class discussion, for lab session, for presentation, for all the activities. They have to write them, let's say, for the presentation. What's the schedule for the presentation? What we will be doing in a particular day? So I write down everything. So I say that this is my agenda. This is what I will be doing and when I will be doing. And then how, because whenever they go to the class, they open the Teams page and then see that, yes, this is what we will be doing today. And then um, who will be presenting and then who will be providing the peer review. So we write down everything. Students were writing, I was writing, TAs were writing. So there was a good communication um, in the class through this Teams page. And then I was also using, because it's not possible to communicate with students if you give access to Teams page, the problem is they can communicate with you and they try to chat with you anytime. This is not possible. So I, at the beginning, I said that only during the class time, um, we will be using Teams. But if they have any question in other time outside the class, they have to use the um, Piazza page. Piazza, I don't know um, whether you use, use Piazza. Piazza is a, is a great option, great communication tool for, um, for a class. Anytime they can actually post. And then um, it's not necessarily that TAs or myself have to respond to that. Um, any, anyone um, can actually respond to each other. Their peers can respond to them. And then I have to see whether the, the answers are right or not. So that was really, really great to, uh, for students to get to know each other because they also write down at the beginning, introduce themselves and the post question 
get help from the teaching team, also from their peers. So these, these are the two tools I was actually using for communication purposes. So for since we were using um, concurrent hybrid modality, because we were using Zoom for online uh, students, and then I created for each session, so you can see office hour, lab, in class discussion for all of them, we only have one um, link. And then I also created student cafes. So anytime if they want to discuss with each other, they can go to those student cafes and then discuss and then uh, maybe uh, solve the problems. So that's uh, for students that I was training. That was helpful for a student because students say that if they do not need to create the Zoom page, they can just join and then work with their peers. And then this is something I did, but it's not necessarily that for a hybrid class you have to do because in computation course, students may stuck at some point whenever they are trying to do some coding. If they have any problem with that, then I have provided TA hour because we have four TAs and myself. So um, four times a, a, a week, they were keeping office hours. And that means um, I was keeping off in our office hours. So five of us was keeping office hours in five days. So we covered all days. So if they have any problem, they can drop by any day. So when I was hearing from students, I heard that because I was trying to learn whether they're achieving their goals and then what they found really, really helpful for them in this hybrid class. So I found that effective course component for achieving their learning goals, mainly they were talking about the group activities. This is something from another area, another area we will talk another day. So I found that the group activities for discussion session or lab activities through the group work, that was really students uh, preferred so that they say that for a hybrid class, that was really, really helpful. But another thing is that when I was actually um, doing the hybrid, the concurrent hybrid modality, I applied that I saw that some students were doing hybrid because I specifically say that if you are joining in person, then your group mate should be in person. Or if you are joining online, your group mate should be online. You have to make sure. Then after a few weeks, I saw that in the lab session, I saw few, uh, two students were in person and one student was not, was not there. I said, what happened? Where is your group mate? They said, no, no, they are here. They are joining online. I said, oh my gosh, I'm doing hybrid. You are doing hybrid. That means we are doing hybrid square. They said, yes, the way you are doing, we are doing the same um, because it's not possible for all group mates to join uh, in the same platform, but they want to work together. That was working well for them but 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 some groups they actually um couldn't follow uh, because it's really difficult for them to do the hybrid in, in the class time so that's why i say that try to uh, try not to do the hybrid because i'm doing the hybrid but if you do the hybrid that might be a problem for your group mates so what are the um advantages and challenges i actually found through these three terms and i try to overcome with them um, turn by turn, so as long as I go. So hybrid modality created high level of flexibility for me, for TAs and for students, because we could, as an instructor, sometimes we could be, we, we will not be able to join in person. Um, maybe then we can join online. And then we have single communication platform. Even if I cannot be there and I can see, that whether students are getting help or not. And students can see that, yes, um, when, wherever I join, I'm actually getting help. Someone is there for you, there for them. And then splitting the TS was helpful. Um, also in other courses, they applied the same thing. They found that this is helpful so that T because TS are maybe graduate or undergraduate students. So it's so difficult for them to help online and in person together at the same time. So that's, that's really, really not for them. For instructor, it is okay, but not for TA. So if you give them only one platform to help the student, that would be helpful. Solving problems on a shared page. So I saw that during the discussion time, we say that how about you create a Teams page and the way you can actually solve problems together. So because in Teams page, there is an option for creating Word document or maybe Excel page or maybe maybe PowerPoint slides. And then they can actually create those and then work together at the same time. That was helpful. 
So the Bluetooth enable microphone that I can use whenever we don't have any lapo mic, I can walk around in the class providing TA training, practice session for students. Um, that was that was great because, but then again, some students join a little bit late, then we have to remind them what we did and then we have to remind them to watch the video. And then organizing the learning module activities that I showed you how I was doing that, providing them really, really clear guideline and then recording live stream session so that students can see if they miss anything. So what was difficult, as I mentioned to you, mixing online and in person for any group activity. So that was difficult, but then I saw some students were really smart and then they were able to do that. So Wi-Fi connection, um, if you if you if there is a possibility of any Wi-Fi connection, any wired connection, please do that. And then if, if, if you have to use Wi-Fi connection, then sometimes it gets disconnected and mention to the students that you are using Wi-Fi connection. If, if anything um, goes wrong, then TAs are there to help them. So Bluetooth enable microphone. Uh, sometimes what I found is that I walk around in the class and then sometimes it gets disconnected. Then I also mentioned to students that this could happen. So many students show up in person then, and then the capacity in the lab, like one of you were talking about the alternative um, hybrid approach. This could happen um, in there because um, without knowing how many people are coming, that might be a problem. There might be a room capacity because um, then you have to make sure the students follow the rule so that there, there is no problem in there. Okay, so that's all about me, about the advantages and challenges. Now is the time to think about, since you at first thought about what might be uh, the best modality for your course, now is the time to think about what sort of adjustment you think you need to do in hybrid modality. And then what challenge that they may come up for the um, teaching team and for students. So what are the challenges that you can think of if you adjust them or maybe you do not adjust them, you use the same approach, then what, what are the challenges you think can come out? Because we have to think ahead so that we can actually resolve them or anyhow sort them out so that it, it, it can mitigate the problem. Maybe I will give um, Ansley to, to help you with these adjustment questions. Then I will come back in a few minutes. I'll just take a few minutes break. I hope it is okay with you all. Okay, so so th have a think about that, and and then you can unmute. You can um, you can type in the chat box. Hi there, it's Sarah here. Um, thanks so much for this so far. I was really thinking um, in some of our courses we have a lot of guest speakers come in um via zoom so i was really appreciating the note about the bluetooth microphone because something that we found challenging is being able to have uh, students in the room ask their questions and uh this you know the it, it be heard appropriately for people that are joining online and people who are in the room so the bluetooth mic was really um a helpful suggestion there. So that's one one good thing I've taken away so far. Yes, it can be very frustrating for someone who is um, joining on Zoom to not be able to hear what the people in the room are saying for sure. I've also experienced that. So that was an adjustment and uh, and she answered that challenge. How about the rest of you? I am back. Were you, were you able to hear what we were talking about, Saborna, while you were gone? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was able to hear what Sarah was asking. Um, I think you have the guest speaker uh, who are joining online, and then um, then you had trouble. Students were hearing the guest speaker. That's right. I mean, this is something that we found challenging, even you know before COVID and the adjustments that we we had made. But you know, depending on the space you're in on campus, and sometimes not getting to choose the most appropriate spaces. Um, the, your thought about the Bluetooth microphone would allow us to then, you know, really fully have those student students involved. I mean, I used to just bring an old wireless mic with me, but sometimes it still wasn't appropriate, right? So 
those are that's a challenge that we're certainly trying to work out. Yeah, yeah, that's that's helpful. Also, is it possible that students write down on a shared page, maybe maybe Google Drive, or um, so that they can actually have what they're asking is actually written somewhere? Um, because Google Page is possible to share with anyone. It's not just BC people. So that's what I saw uh, in our in our faculty. We have some uh, workshops um, that we are actually doing every workshop and everything in a hybrid mode, and then people are typing their uh, typing their questions, um, and the in person students also were typing their questions. And sometimes we actually give them the mic, and then they actually answer to the, the, the ask their questions. So if you have if you can have two people cover the entire class who are joining in person. And if you can give them mic in, in both areas, that would be helpful. I think pre-pandemic, we also use that. Um, and then I can see there is a question, and then, not question, I think you were asking, I think the challenge the challenge is for courses with less TA support. Yes, certainly. And then how to effectively engage both modalities for students still, because um, my app, yes. So I was using this approach. I like the shared document, but I wonder about courses with less support. So one thing I should mention to you is that during the lab time, I only had TAs there. But whenever we have the discussion session, whenever I was actually introducing them to the course material, then TAs were not there. So that means I was the only person. So that's something I will try this time in the class from this fall. So I will try to support both students. So I have to mention, mention to both groups that how I'm doing that. And without any TA support, I think it, it is very much possible. So, so, so the only important thing I found is that all people are asking questions on this on the shared drive or or maybe on a shared page, so that everyone online in person students can see that. Because sometimes in person students ask some questions. If we don't have the mic, if we don't have TA, then I cannot give the TA, give the students the lapel mic or any kind of mic. And it's, it's not possible to hear them if we have a larger class. It will be really, really helpful. And if students are working in a group, one of them um, bring in laptop or one of them might bring in their cell phone. So they can actually use their cell phone to type in because uh, teams can, uh, can be loaded on any, any device. That's what I found. Or they can use the browser as well. So, okay, so I see another question for Jocelyn. What were your strategies for managing your time and cognitive, uh, cognitive load when attending two questions and engaging without TA support? Did you set specific time for questions, comments, or take questions throughout the class? So I actually set time. So I divided the class, class time into two parts. One is the discussion part. Another is the Q&A part so that students can ask many questions. Or anytime in the shared page, they can write down their question. It's not necessarily that they have to write down the question or exactly at the same time. They can write down the question before, and then I, I answer them at the specific time. Otherwise, there is a mixture I cannot cover everything. I hope that was that's what you were asking. Thank you, Jocelyn, that's wonderful. Anyone, you can... Uh, Turn, turn on your mic and then ask question. So the way, any what do you think about the adjustment? Because I offered this course online, I offered this course in person pre-pandemic. And then, then I realized that how about we actually combine them? Maybe that's the same case for you. You offered the same course before pandemic in person and then during pandemic, maybe at least a year, you offered it online. And then whenever you are supporting students or maybe adapting this modality, then what do you think the adjustment is needed? Maybe look at your modules and throughout your modules where you think some adjustment is needed. And then again, challenging. Yes, whenever you will be offering them in a hybrid mode, always there will be some challenges. How you can um, you can actually sort of try to mitigate those. And then also sometimes ask students, how do you feel? And then what do you think we should do? Sometimes they actually uh, have some ideas because um, they are taking the course. They are the they are the people who are having this experience. So maybe they have some ideas because they're also taking other courses. And that happened to me because while I offered it first time, then um, I actually gave training to other instructors. And when they actually offered it, same time, students were joining in my class, also in other classes. In a hybrid modality, they were doing that and they've suggested can we do it? Can we do that? So that was really, really helpful. Yes. 
Ainsley, thank you. That was that is helpful. Anyhow, so my plan for all of you is that okay. So John, you ask another question. How large was your class, and do and do you see any challenges scaling up, such as adding a tier for lectures as a class gets larger? Yeah, that's something because I let me give you an example. Um, when I offered it in summer, I only had about twenty students, and then most of them were online. And only two students were in person because this is first time um, sometime in July I offered that course and the students were not at all back. Only two students said that we want to be in person. Then that was not a problem to, to um, run in a hybrid mode. When I offered it in the, in the next term, then I had 57 students. And then um, let me actually show you because I, I wanted to show, I will go back. So you can see um, 42 students actually um, took the surveys. So the in-person students, you can see we had 17 and 25. We had more, but then again, not all of them solved that. So we, you can say that about 45 and 55 uh, percent students took it online and in-person. So the 50 altogether, it was uh, 57. But when I offered it um, last term in the spring term, then I had larger class about um, 87 students. And then many students, because you know, during this term one at UBC, we most we actually went in person sometime in mid-February. So before mid-February, uh, we were all online. We were not allowed to go in person. Then from mid-February, we went to class and then um, I think about 60 students joined online and then 30 students about they joined in person and then actually it grew after a few weeks. So after the midterm exam, about 40 students, 40 percent students joined in person and then 60 percent online. So for scaling up, adding for scaling up, adding a TA for lecture, for the lecture time, I don't think we need TAs uh, because if the students are writing their question then in a, in a same fashion, you can run them because in your lecture time, um, because that's what I preferred in my lecture time, I actually talk 15 minutes and then and I give them five minutes to, to discuss with me and then again 15 minutes to talk with me. But during the discussion time, I use half an hour for discussion and then 20 minutes for Q and A. So that time I don't, um, I don't actually um, involve any TA. But scaling up because I went a little bit um, in a slower mode from from the summer term to the term one and term two. Slowly, my students actually, um, I had larger number of students, so that was really manageable. And then again, I will do because this summer I'm not teaching. And then uh, from this fall, I'll be teaching again in a hybrid mode in all my classes. Does that answer your question, John? Okay, so now if you don't have any question, then my plan is that I would like to talk about um, the research I was doing because from the class, I was trying to understand um, how this modality is working. I hear verbally from TAs, from students, but then again, if we actually collect some data set from the class, then how is it, how we, whether we can measure them? So that was where I started. I hope you will find interesting since we have some time. And then I will try about 20 minutes, I will talk about my research. And then if you have any question, you can actually post on the chat box. And then um, if we have enough time, I will respond to that. And then I think we will have enough time to respond to any question you have. So I was trying to measure the confidences in learning modules, in each learning modules, also overall how students were feeling in this modality. Um, and then whether there is any change in self-efficacy and any change in engagement, change in terms of from, let's say, beginning of the term, midterm, end of the term, whether there is any increment or maybe it's totally flat. So what happened in there? Well, how about the trends in gaining the mastery? So whether they are actually feeling like they gained um, the knowledge they wanted to, and then they actually feel like for longer term, they can actually in implement that in co-op jobs or maybe in high level uh, studies or maybe in their professional career, whether they want to do it. Whether there is any mastery differences in each of those modules among online and in-person students. And then I was trying to see, and then since I am also a statistician, um, and then I was trying to see whether I can develop some model 
so that I can make inference for any kind of mastery levels that I was doing that in an ordinal fashion. Um, and then based on that, so whether previous experience, that means whether they took the courses, um, took other courses, similar courses before, or quantitative analysis courses, and joining the platform is making any changes or not, and the how about the demographics, and whether they, those are playing in anything for mastery levels. So for me, the evolution strategy that I followed is that I collected three surveys, and then in that three surveys, beginning of the term, midterm, end of the term, so I sent three um, three surveys. I have um, a human ethics approval from uh, UBC um, Rice, and then through that, I was sending them the at the beginning. I was asking them, "What's the learning goal from this course? How about their expectation?" And then um, their experiences, and then their demographics question. I was also asking them, um, and then self-efficacy that came up in the midterm, and then how confident they feel applying the learned materials, and how about they're gaining the mastery, and then how about the engagement part. Same thing I ask in the midterm, in the end of the term. At the end of the term, I also ask them, how about they go back to their learning goals that they had at the beginning and the way that those were met or not, how they feel about those. And then whether um, they are joining because I asked them same questions at the beginning where they want to join online or in person. At end of the term, I ask them, since they, they have flexibility to join in person or online, I ask them again, so where you join most of the time, not that you, you join online or in person, most of the time where you actually join, then they have to mention that, yes, um, I join mostly online or in person. So the data summary, I collected a lot of data set, and I'm just showing you a few of them, the demographics, and then a few um, the previous experiences they have. So you can see that we have collected data set for um, their gender and the language. That means um, they are English speaker or non-native English speaker. And how about their previous experience in terms of, let's say they took similar level of courses, or sometimes we have um, students from first year in the second year level course. And then well, sometimes we have, because in the faculty of forestry, we have three plus two, two plus two program. And then well, we have students who are from four Chinese universities. So they do um, their second year or they do up to their third year over there and then they come in here. So that means they have higher level than uh, who are joining at the second year level. So I just asked them what's the real level in their study. And then I created a new variable is zero so that I know uh, if I join these two then I have an idea of um, what might be there that might be an indicator of previous experience because that also plays some role. So when I was looking at two different confidences so since I collect a lot of um, data set and then in confidence level one so I'm just showing you two of them I asked them how comfortable they are learning computer application in forestry so you can see that that's what I found because this is not uh, the, the final analysis this is from the preliminary analysis from term one so we collected also from data set from term two is not yet analyzed so in term one data set I found that students were saying that in-person students were feeling stronger or their levels are higher, the percentages were higher in online than in person. And then I'm trying to understand why was that. And I saw that in several confidence levels, also in, in some mastery level. You can see that for end of the term, same thing happened in person versus online. Students had higher percentages who were feeling strongly. Um, and then the percentages were higher online. So that means students were, one thing that came up in my mind is that maybe students are so used to online and that they're so comfortable and then maybe they are less distracted. I, can, I don't know, but people say that they are more, more distracted online than in person. But I see that and then I'm trying to understand why, why it happened. And then when I was asking them about confidence level, so, so that they can generate some um, them. They can create some summaries and then, and then create some visualization tool. Then we, we saw the same thing and then you can see it's improved. And then the good thing is that whenever the confidence levels we look at midterm to the end of the term, it definitely improved over term. That means they were gaining more confidence over the term. It's a general pattern online and in person.
Then um, I combined the total the mastery level because I have six mastery mastery uh, questions. I asked them about gaining the mastery, and I combined them. Uh, and then each of them were asked from zero to 10. And I asked them whether you gain the mastery and, and then you can actually um, in a Likert scale, you can let us know. Also, they say that from zero to 10, what they feel. Um, so I combined them, all the mastery levels. And then you can see the range is from zero to 60. And then I was trying to look at whether their median is actually improving or not. But in person students, you can see that um, Again, it shows the same thing in the mastery level, like we saw in the confidence uh, level, online students had higher uh, mastery gained that they felt it's not like we are analyzing their grades, it's like we are actually analyzing their um, the, what they feel was the reflection. So yeah, I try to look at if we actually divide them for gender, male and female, and uh, I saw that ma male students were actually showing more um, mastery level gain that they self-reflected than female. But that can be another reason I was talking to one of the researchers in this field. They were saying that, you know what, actually female students, they actually shy about, or maybe they actually um, present themselves in a, in, a, in a less or or maybe they, they actually do not show just like what what the male student might show so that might be one of the reasons that I was not aware of and then um, we also see that if we have language proficiency that means the non-native speakers were a little bit lower um, mastery gained in total than the um, Native speaker. So the when I was trying to see if I want to test them, I want to compare the confidence because we saw visually, but how about we test them using some statistical test? So I was comparing their confidence and self-efficacy in midterm versus in the term. Also, I was trying to see online versus in person. So many kind, many, many. A test I perform, I would like to show you only a few of them. So I was using the Wilcoxon pair test where we can actually compare the two groups and then whether there is any significant difference between those groups or not. So um, I was looking at in-person versus online. And then I was also looking at the modality um, the, and then the midterm versus end of the term and then whether there is any increment in there. At first, I tested whether they are the, they are the same or not. Then I tested which one. If I see that there is, they are actually not the same, then I like, try to look at uh, more, um, more in-depth analysis. I like to see which one is better or maybe which one is higher, not better. So, um, so in conclusion, I would like to say that yeah, I was using, I was testing them using the p-values, and then I saw that among online group, there is a significant difference on students' confidence level between midterm and end of the term in four confidence levels, but the other confidence levels, I do not see any differences. When I was looking at most confidence and self-efficacy variables, we do not see um, enough, we do not have enough evidence so that we can actually reject the null hypothesis. Null hypothesis was that there is no difference. That is, we found that there is no difference in person and online group in midterm evaluation. But then again, in the visualization, you saw that they were similar. They were not similar, they were one of them were higher. Then I was trying to uh, develop some model. This is the preliminary model I'm trying to develop. And then I was trying to see if we have the mastery level from zero to 10, whether we can predict them, make an inference, um, if we have some explanatory variables, using those, whether we can actually say that what might be their mastery level. So if we know where they joined in a hybrid modality, in person or online, and then whether what's their gender, and then what's their language proficiency, and then how about their corresponding experience level? Uh, so that means they have some experience in that particular module. And previous experience is not just particular experience, a particular module, it's more about the, the course they took before, that means similar type of course, or maybe quantitative analysis, or maybe some stat course they took before, and what's that year yeah level. So if we if we have an idea of this, then whether we can actually make an inference, what might be their mastery level. So that was my main goal. Um, then when I 
repeated the model. Then I saw that because it, since it's a preliminary model, some of the variables were not showing not significant bugging, and we still need them to understand what might be affecting those. So that's why you can see the platform, gender, native speaker, and then since we have dummy variable, that means we have qualitative um, information. So no experience versus some experience and no experience versus proficiency. So you can see that they were playing some role, but then again, um, major item I saw is from platform they joined, gender, um, that means that were playing some roles, but then again, uh, for each of the categories, each of the values, let's say zero to 10, then compared to each other, what would be their starting point? That's why intercept is, let me draw that would be useful. So that's what it's telling us since we have the factor level. So because I converted zero to 10 to factor and then each factor. So we are trying to see if we have compared to another one then what might be their intercept? That means where we are going to start. And then conclusion from the treated model, because the um, ordinal logistic regression model is in a logarithm form to make it more easier because logarithm form, it's not, it's really difficult to interpret. So that's why I try to convert it to easier form so that we can, we can actually uh, easily, easily uh, compare them. So you can see that in the platform, let's say whether they are joining online or in person, in the mo in the fitted model, it shows that online students has more, that means four, above, four times higher mastery level than in person. That's what I was not seeing in the test in some, in some mastery level. And then uh, the gender, the male students have almost same like 4%, four times higher mastery levels. And then non uh, native speaker, native means English speaker, sorry, is 2.4858 times higher mastery level. If we compare no experience versus some experience, that means we have some, ex then some experience were showing 1.5 times higher. And then for no experience versus proficient, that was showing 2.32. Obviously, that will happen because if they are more experienced than no experienced person. And if we have one unit increase in the uh, previous experience, you can see that it's actually showing higher mastery level, um, 2.08 times more. So that's that's it's telling me in the heated model, but then again, it's a preliminary model. I have to use the term two data set and then also look into detail for term one. This is only for one mastery level and we have uh, six mastery levels. So in conclusion, I just want to say what I just showed you. So that, that means confidence levels in most of the learning modules increased over the term. That means midterm versus end of the term. And then confidence, engagement, self-efficacy variable, um, not, it was not showing much differences in person and online, but then again, whenever it comes to language, or previous experience, corresponding experience. That means they have some experience in those modules um, because some of the students actually learned how to analyze partial data set in the software in other course before, then it actually made some changes. So that was really, really important for gaining the mastery in this course. And then I use some references uh, for this research. I, um, at the beginning, I also gave you um, how, when I was choosing the modality. So that's about the research and then it's, it's ongoing. So I would like to acknowledge the funding uh, agency it's from UBC, um, ETLT and Provost Office. We also have co-applicants project team members and consultation, uh, consultation support that I enormously received from CTLT. And then at development stage, the students and then some colleagues helped me. Also evaluation team, um, that means for the research, I received some help from CTLT, also from faculty of university. And that's about it. Thank you all so much. And now is the time for Q&A. Okay, so if you have any question, feel free to ask me. So if you want to show your uh, course or any kinds of um, any place where you think you can apply, so maybe let me know. We can discuss right now. We have some time. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Wilma and Bree. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, your feedback is always helpful. Thank you, Jocelyn. I hope I'm saying all people's name right. Pronunciation matters. So if you have any question, you can ask me. I know we had Q&A a few times, but I can, I can, I can talk more. 
So final level of mastery data was all based on self-reported data, but not grade and success in the course. No, it's not based on, um, based on their grad grades because um, I feel like their grades are not um, the, the, the one that we actually can use. But then again, in many studies I saw they use their grades but I need to do further study so that with, whether how effectively we can use grades, whether they are reflecting their, um, their mastery they gained. And if they can self-reflect, that's the most important thing I found. That's, that's why I was using their self-reflection. Are there any opportunities? So Moe, you said opportunity to aud audit your course for alumni. Oh, yeah, certainly. You can email me and then... Um, and then I will, because maybe I will have to ask our student service to include you to the course, because um, if, if anyone audit the course, then it might be the best if they go through the system, then you get access to everywhere. Otherwise, getting access to team space, getting access to the Piazza page is a problem, but if it is through the system, then like the registration system, that might be better. Yeah, so time to time, I also take um, students, um, auditors. Students can do totally online. Students can do totally in person or they can mix up. So that's not a problem, anything. And these days I think it's much needed because how comfortable people are. How did you manage the enrollment of your students in Teams? TS managing enrollment. Um, I No, not TS. I actually manage that, but you can actually show your TS how to add them. And then I ask students so that they actually write down their student uh, email address at the rate of student.ubc.ca they should have that it's it's just one second they can make it and then if they write it down on the teams page then i actually copy paste into teams um no, sorry on piazza page they write down and then i copy paste into teams and then it's possible that you can give link to the students and the students can self uh, enroll themselves on teams but I prefer not to do that because they can distribute it. I don't want anyone without um, permission or or I want to control teams because I want to have only, only the students we have in our class. Yeah, so self, um, self enrollment also works. Yes, but I always worry about that. If I don't know who, who has who has access to my course, then that's the problem. Thank you so much, Mary. I found <laughs> that you found it's helpful. Thank you so much. Anytime, if you want to know further, you can email me and then I can actually help you if you want to modify anything. Anyone have any last minute question or anything? Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Brie, that you found it helpful. Much more um, research or research outputs is coming in a few months. So I hope I can share with you all. Super, and I have one more quick question. Um, <laughs> did you did you find um, or I'm not sure if you measured for this, but your perceptions of student engagement, whether they were attending online or in person, did you notice big differences in how students were engaging in the course based on their modality? Um, no, because they have to, because in each class, that's what I did, because during, during the pandemic, that's what I learned. It, I have to provide them some task and they have to complete the task within the class time. So that's how I manage the engagement part. And then I actually give them really, really simple question. So let's say I talk for 15 minutes, I ask them question and they have to submit that. So that's how I manage. Otherwise, online students, what they are doing since their video is not on or we do not see just like in-person students, we do not see what they're doing. So they, or they are actually following what I am actually describing. So that's what something I do. And then, and then they also have the group activities. That means it's not like they, they have to solve alone. They can actually talk with their classmen, uh, sorry, peers and submit. So that's how I maintained it. But at the beginning, yes, certainly I saw that students were, um, some of them were not following or engaging in the class. And then this is after, after applying it, this is one of the challenge. After applying that technique, I saw that students were more focused and then they actually complete everything on time. And then the midterm final exam, they were doing, doing it uh, properly. That's really helpful. Thank you for your response and this presentation. Hi, Saborna. This is uh, John. I, I actually work as a learning designer at CTLP. And um, 
uh, I also know Jocelyn. <laughs> um, and uh, I work with a colleague, uh, Lucas Wright, who's uh, who was talking about setting up possibly a community practice around uh, hi- concurrent hybrid, actually. And um, uh, because I'm linked to him in another conversation, I was just wondering if you would be interested interested in something like that for the university, because I know he was looking to reach out to faculty instructors who are doing hybrid uh, or concurrent hybrid learning and um, was thinking about some sort of community of practice at, at some point in time, because I know it's becoming a little bit, um, well, it's growing at the university mm-hmm. and a few other units are doing it as well. And so if I reached out to you, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I was just going to say, I was going to reach out to you and, uh, and oh, sure. invite you possibly at some point. Um, and, uh, um, but thank you for your presentation. Thank you, John. Yeah, that I would be really, really interested. And then since I have more research outcome is coming, that might be also interest for your team. Thank you. And, yes. <laughs> and then Jeff, actually, at the beginning, Jeff Miller. Um, yes. He helped yes. Me. Yeah. So the, while I was trying to find out which modality might be the best and how I can actually convert or maybe adjust, then he helped me throughout the process. Great. Yes, I, I work with Jeff as well. Yeah, he's, he's great. <laughs> Also, he engaged evolution team, um, and then Adriana, oh, okay. yeah, evolution Adriana, team. yeah, yeah. Adriana, oh, and they helped you with the evaluation piece. Yeah, Adriana, and then Adriana engaged uh, Zara, and then um, okay. they were really, really helpful because I, while well, I was trying to set up all the questions and the mastery levels and everything, so because I was not that proficient, and then uh, throughout the process, I learned and then um, tried to apply them. So that was that was helpful. But anyhow, uh, thanks for that you found it useful. That would be I would be happy to collaborate with you. Perfect. I'll reach out very soon. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone have any other question or anything you want to share? I think that's about it.